Will you pray with me, pray together for the Spirit's light? Speak to us, God, and bend our hearts to listen so that we may trust your unfathomable love for us and respond to your call to us and be changed by your power in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is responsive. You will find verses from the 145th Psalm in your bulletin. I will extol you, my God, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And the second scripture reading this day comes from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. This was a community that Paul knew fairly well, but remember these were still the early days of Christianity. Ephesians was probably written around the year 50, maybe a little bit later than that, just 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the early church is still trying to figure out what it means to be followers of Christ and what it means to be followers of Christ together. And we hear some of that unfolding in this reading today. Paul writes, therefore remember that you, formerly Gentiles in the flesh, were in that era, meaning before Christ, without the anointed one. You were aliens to the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise without any hope and godless in the cosmos. But now in the anointed one, Jesus, you who were once far, far away have come to be near through the blood of the anointed. For he is himself our peace. He has made the two into one and shattered through his flesh the dividing wall of partition, the enmity. He abolished the law made up of dogmatic commandments that in himself he might fashion the two into a single new human being, making peace, and that he might by the cross reconcile the two to God in one body, in himself killing enmity. And he came announcing the glad tidings of peace to you who are far, far away, as well as those who were nearby, because through him we both have access to the one spirit, in the one spirit, to the one head of the family. In this way, then, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but are instead fellow citizens with the Holy Ones and are members of God's household, which is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the anointed one Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In him, every edifice that is built grows into a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are together being built up in the spirit to be the dwelling place of God. Let us pray. Blessed God, thank you for these words of life. May my words now reflect your word for us here in this place and time with all that we bring to the table, our hopes and fears, gratitude and anxieties, large and small. 
May your spirit dwell in us richly through your word. Amen. Hi! Wow! Here we are! And this is a blessed day indeed. Ah, this is great. This is great because together, God and this congregation are right now writing a new chapter in the long life of First Church. For those of you who don't know, I come from the Midwest, where there is nothing except kind of the land and the rocks itself that are 388 years old. So it is a long history indeed. The previous chapters of the life of this congregation are filled with faith and struggle, with joy and sorrow, with mistakes and rebounds, with friendship and loneliness and sin, unrecognized and hidden, and sin acknowledged and forgiveness received. The previous chapters have been filled with the spirit hovering, nudging, indwelling, moving. And my friends, all of those threads of the past now continue one of the characters has changed, in case you didn't know, that's me. But this is a new chapter. Just a new chapter. Not a whole new tale. The story is your story. Or rather, it is God's story written through you, the people of this congregation, people of the past, people of the present, and people of the future. Through all of you, the story unfolds. So it is good to be with you. Good to be together for this part of the story. But maybe you noticed the conceit in what I just said. That whole analogy of a new chapter in the life of the congregation is kind of based on the assumption that the transition from one senior minister to another is like important enough to be a new chapter. Given that there have been, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand members of this congregation over 388 years. You know, it's a pretty bold move to claim that, what is it, like 17 of us or something like that? Yeah, um, actually make that much of a difference. Um, now, I don't really want to deny the importance of pastoral leadership in the congregation. After 35 years of doing this work, I am more convinced than ever that good pastoral leadership is one critical component in helping lead a congregation into faithfulness in the world today. But this is still your story. This is God's story written through you, and it's good, especially as the pastor, to be a little humble about just when one chapter ends and another chapter begins. Still, something is new today if only because this exact gathering of First Church of Cambridge has never happened before. Because this exact body of people has never gathered before. Each one of you, each one of us, with our own stories, our own experiences, our own faith, our own questions, 
our own sense of the presence of God in our lives. None of that has all come together in one place before. And so this is a new day. We have been brought together and formed into one thread, one prayer, if you will, offered this day to God. One of my favorite forms of music is improvisation. Whenever people ask uh, that icebreaker question, uh, I, you probably recognize it, right? If you could go back in time to one point in history, where would you go to? What point in history would that be? When I'm asked that question, I often say that I, wa I would want to go back to one of the summer evenings in about 1795 in Vienna and listen to an improvisation by Beethoven on the piano. He was a master of the form, and each work, as it's come down, reported to us through the years, each work was creative and brilliant and unique. And just to witness one of those unique improvisations would be such a gift and experience. Well, that's today, too, here in this place. This is a beautiful moment, and it has many precursors, and it will have many echoes, but exactly because we, each one of us, are together, this is also a creative and brilliant and unique moment. So there is something new today, and we are regathering, not just today, but regathering for whatever is next in the life of this congregation. Maybe it's a new chapter. Maybe it's a new paragraph. Maybe it's a new sentence or a new word. In God's eyes, it may be just a space after a comma or a breath that the reader takes as the story unfolds. But whatever it is, I will work with you for the next 18 months or so to make it be a creative, brilliant, unique, and faithful time. You know, it's good to think about the newness of this day, the newness of the next few months, because thinking about newness helps us better understand the New Testament, especially today's reading from Ephesians. It's easy to lose sight of it when your congregation is 388 years old, and even more so when you're part of a 2,000-year-old branch of an even older faith. But all those years ago, Christianity itself was something brand new in the world. The church has certainly had its ages of stultifying traditionalism and ossification, but Jesus and the movement that arose in his name was insanely new. As a faithful Jew, Jesus took the threads of his ancient faith and he wove them together in new ways to infuse them with new life. In his teaching, there is clear continuity with the ancient faith of Israel, and yet like a musical improvisation, he created something new and different. And the difference lies not so much in the teaching, which can honestly, almost all of it be found in the Old Testament, but rather the newness is in Jesus' vision of who the story was about. And if you've picked up on our regathering theme already, you'll know that the point is that there is room for us all in this story. 
You see, the early church was not just based on a set of teachings about God. The early church was a new type of people, a new political reality, if you like that language. Christianity emerged in a world of empires, giant, violent, vast, rulers of kings. In Jesus' day, it was the Roman Empire, of course, and before that, it was the Greek, and before that, the Persian, and before that, the Babylonian, before that, the Assyrian, and probably others lost to the reaches of history. What it meant to be a people in those days was to be under the rule of the king, an emperor. That made you who you are. And empires, of course, are built on military conquest. War is at the heart of it all. But Jesus, drawing on developments already at work among his Jewish people, conceived of a people that was not defined by empire, but by a common vision of the good grounded in God. But what was the Jesus movement to call this new type of people? It was something new on the face of this earth and there was not even a word for it. It wasn't an empire, certainly. It wasn't in what we today might call an ethnicity. It wasn't a nation. It wasn't even a family. And it sure just wasn't a bunch of isolated individuals. The early church tried out a variety of vocabulary to describe the nature of this new community using lots of adjectives to do what the words couldn't do themselves. A holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. But the image that really comes to the fore in the letters of Paul is that of a household. The household of God. A household is like a family. But especially in the biblical world, a household is so much more. A household included extended family members of all sorts, by birth, by marriage, by necessity, by generosity. It included workers, servants or slaves, depending on the level of financial desperation. It included those we would today call found family, people you can trust and enjoy your, your tribe. The first people you text when the car breaks down and you need a ride to a doctor's appointment or when the school calls and says that your child has a fever and you have to come and pick them up, but you also have to be at a work meeting. The first person you call when that happens. A household was an economic unit of production as well. Indeed, our word economics is rooted in the Greek word for household. How to make a household work. Maybe the best way to think of a biblical household is as a group of people who share a common life and a common fate people with a common vision of the good, people who just make it work together. And in Ephesians, Paul's point is, yo, look what God has done. God has brought together this crazy household of people, people that used to be totally different. Some were with God and some were far, far off. 
Some were mainstream and some were swimming in the eddies along the edges of the river. Some were wrapped up in the patriotic identity of empire and some were crushed by that empire. Some were the cool kids and some were the math geeks. Not that the math geeks weren't cool, but you know what I mean, right? Some were venture capitalists. Some were drive-through fast food workers. Some were queer folks, and some just had the same old sexuality. Some were protesters, and some were the ones being protested. Some the sinners, well, all the sinners, and all the forgiven. Look at the crazy household that our God has brought together. It's a household where there is room for us all and room for all of us, all that each of us are. We are, of course, not just any household, but we are the household of God. That means that God is the head of our household, the glue, the identity that binds all of it together, the spirit that infuses each member. In Jesus' day, admittedly, the head of the household was nearly always male, Although we see signs in Scripture, especially in the story of Tabitha in the book of Acts, that there were women head of households as well. But in Jesus' day, usually they were men. So Jesus taught us to call God Father, as in the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. We, in this congregation, substitute creator in what we write out in the liturgy, but honestly, that word, that word loses something of the personal household imagery that is implied with Jesus' word, Abba, Father. Say what you want about or when we say, say what you want when we say the prayer together in just a little while. You can say creator as is written, or mother, father, opa, granny, mamala. <laughs> Remember though, that the one to whom we pray is the head of our household, the glue that binds us together the one who, through Jesus, anointed us for this very task, the one who has made room for us all in the household of God. So here we are. Wow. It is a blessing to be together. It's something new. Mm, something, a chapter, a word, a breath, a new day. It is something new. Emerging from all that has come before, it's a new household of God called into being by Jesus with room for us all. In the name of the living God, amen.